Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the National Museum of Australia. My name's Heidi Pritchard, and I'm the manager of the community outreach section. And as always, I'd like to quickly acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the traditional custodians of this land in which we meet, their vibrant and ongoing culture. Now, it is great to have you all here today, and thank you so much for coming. This is the first in what we hope will become the annual Australian of the Year lecture. And it's particularly wonderful that we get to do the first one with Rosie. It's appropriate that we have this event here at the National Museum because we're a social history museum. We tell stories. We're where our stories live and where our stories come alive. During the week we had the senior Australian of the Year, Jackie French, who was launching her book, Horace the Horse. And she told us that books are the magic potion for the imagination. And that really resonates with us. So today we have Rosie telling us her story of advocacy and how one person can really change a national debate. The National Museum, we have a lovely relationship with the Australia Day Council. And last year we exhibited items from all of the state and territory finalists. We're launching the exhibition again. And once again, we're showing that stories can be told using objects. And it's lovely. Rosie actually had her doll here. A beautiful moment. So we're launching on the 16th of December, and I strongly encourage you all to come and see it over the holidays. Bring your families, bring your friends, come to our Australia Day Festival. Now, we're very lucky today as well to have Sarah Ferguson mm -hmm. from the ABC here doing the interview. Sarah's had one heck of a career. And I'm absolutely sure she needs no introduction. Despite that, uh, everybody I've spoken to agrees that Sarah was the perfect choice for this conversation. Uh, actually, including Rosie. Rosie said, oh, yeah, she's the perfect choice. Yeah. <laughs> Which was lucky, because had she have said, she's not the perfect choice, <laughs> then it would have been me doing the conversation. And trust me, you want Sarah. Sarah began her journalistic career in newspapers in the UK before moving to France, where she worked for the BBC. In Australia, she's worked for the SBS program Dateline and Insight as both the producer and the reporter. Sarah's worked for the Channel 9 program Sunday, Four Corners, and recently was working on the 7.30 report. She's also currently working on a really interesting two-part series that I want you all to keep an eye out for. But for now, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Sarah Ferguson and Rosie Batty. Thank you all so much for coming. It's lovely to see such a full auditorium. Although it's not a perfect Canberra day, I left a perfect Sydney day, but um, still, it's lovely to see you all here during the day to listen to this extraordinary person. It was a very easy uh, question for me to answer when they asked me if I would come down here and have a chat with, in front of you with Rosie. There are very few people that you meet in your life, in your career, who single-handedly change, shift the paradigm. It's a bit of an ugly word, but it's true, who actually shift and change the way we think about the lives we lead. It's such a rare thing. So an easy, very easy question for me to answer. And the reason they did ask, uh, which we, we referred to just now, is I'm in the middle of making a series on domestic violence for the ABC, which will be on at the end of November. And when I set out to make that series, the very first thing I did, I was working on a political series at the time, but I stopped to go and have lunch with Rosie. And we had a bit of a boozy lunch in Newtown, where <laughs> Rosie was wearing one of her crazy hats. But the reason that I wanted to sit down with her was because I wanted to ask her where she thought I should focus my thinking, where in this landscape of this extraordinary issue uh, that we all need to grapple with, where we should focus our thoughts. And again, because of that thing that I understood about her from everything that I've seen, that peculi peculiarly powerful authenticity that Rosie has, that many people have written about, have witnessed um, in the course of this extraordinary couple of years. Now, we're here, of course, to reflect on Rosie's year of Australia, as Australian of the Year and to talk a little bit about her book, which I've read and which I strongly recommend, and Rosie will be available for book signings afterwards. But that is another extraordinary piece of work. And she just told me that in the course of this year, I think that she's going to be up to 300 events in her Australian of the Year year, reaching directly, that means talking directly to 70,000 people. So where, yes, exactly. <laughs> 
where in the course of that year she's had time to write a book. You know, I lead a busy life, I cannot begin to imagine, but uh, there's no sense of that hurriedness in the book. So, Rosie, the reason that I wanted to see you that day, I think, is the reason why a lot of people come um, to hear you speak, which is that bafflement that we all felt, that it, how is it that you managed to step out um, the day after Luke died? And that, that's really the moment where I want to start. You're, you describe it beautifully in the book. You're crumpled on the sofa. I think you're holding onto the SpongeBob mm. square pants. And the media, of course, as we do, we're amassed outside. And I meet a lot of people making this series, people working in domestic mm. violence. They want to protect victims and victims' families and sometimes mm. to the point of stifling their stories. Mm. And I say to them, just imagine trying to stifle Rosie Batty. It isn't always the right thing to do. Mm. What is it that made you get off the sofa that day? Oh, I think stubbornness. Um, I still find maybe that people try to protect me and shield me from things they think might upset me or because they think I'm busy. And in the earlier stages, obviously, they felt that, um, you know, what when you've got something like that happen, everyone just wants to do something to, to help you. And I think that... Um, it would be a natural feeling for them to want to protect me and feel that the me protection from the media is part of their role. Mm. But I guess I've lived a long, you know, my life has been making my own decisions and that wasn't going to change, um, you know, whether it was m making sure that the funeral was what I wanted it to be and not just... Um, what everybody else wanted it to be, that I had a voice. So I think that that really was it. But I have to say, Sarah, that um, I'm glad she described it as a boozy lunch because I can't remember any of the answers I gave her. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing was that most of the people there were being terribly serious and work-like, and you said, but surely we're going to have a drink, aren't we? <laughs> so I don't I know what she's saying about me. That is not true. <laughs> I think only you and I were the ones having the drink. That's what I remember most of all, actually. But... That, that day, stepping out in front of the media and in those early yeah. days, how did you know what to say? Look, I didn't, and I think that, you know, I'm lucky, I guess, that when you look at your life experience and you look at your career that you've had, um, your strengths and your weaknesses, sometimes perhaps they just come together at the right time. And all I can say is, you know, I was just relieved... When my friends saw me on the news, they said, wow, Rosie, that was great, and not, oh, my God, what have you just said? Because I was, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that what I said would be seen as something quite unique, different, strong. I just spoke from the heart. And, you know, what I find in life is when things go wrong, it's very common for us to want to blame and the ugliness of humanity comes to the fore. And we look for vengeance and recrimination and, you know, I didn't want that. I didn't want that and it's never been part of me. And I wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity, I think, um, for Luke's death to be seen as a tragedy and, and from something that... Um, you know, you, you, I know too that it's normally what we learn from tragedy. It's really sad that it takes tragic events for us to become aware of an issue or to seek change, either as legislation or policy or attitudinal. And I think, you know, that was part of... I felt like there was, a, there was only ever going to be a brief window in time to get, capture that the media or the, um, the attention of people to make a difference. And I had no way, no way of understanding hmm. or knowing that that was going to continue to this point. You know, one, one of the extraordinary things that moment did um, was to shift the attention away from Luke's father onto Luke and onto yourself. Now, you had practised yeah. quite an extraordinary degree of compassion and understanding about mm. him in that very troubled history. Uh, but how conscious a decision was that to move people's attention away from him? Well, I think it's really easy to demonise people and to, you know, seek to blame and focus on that 
um, and not really learn anything from it. And so, you know, what is there to be gained? You know, it's not condoning what Greg did. I'm incredibly sad that there was nothing I could do to intervene and stop something that um, you wished had never happened. But to focus on that ugliness um, pulls you into that space. And so I think that, you know, even though it's really easy, you seek to be a better person through something. And I guess that's always been my way of trying to handle life, is try, how can it be, I be a better person through this? And this event, of course, losing Luke, was, was the biggest test that you can ever have. But still, you want to be the better person through it. Now, was that something that you were already thinking about? Was that a, um, a, a, a journey of self-examination that you were already on? Yeah, because, you know, I had 12 years with Greg. Not with him, but 12 years subjected to his abuse. And I could allow myself to be equally as vindictive or, you know, behave in a derogatory way or a blaming way. But I wanted to be the best role model for Luke and to support him in, in understanding what compassion and empathy and how to be a good friend and be a good person and a spiritual person. And I wanted him to, you know, also have that as a modeling. And so I always, even though I, at times, you know, felt incredibly angry with Greg or would be hysterical or, and, and frequently was, I've tried to find a place of how I can not let him define me, not help, let him ruin our lives, but how can I sit, you know, be bigger than this um, for Luke to grow into a man that is not going to be a big, an abusive man, but is going to be a kind, caring, sensitive soul. And he, and he was, not without fault, but he clearly was on that path. And so I think, um, you know, for me, you know, I had to really challenge myself to be that better person, yeah. Now, actually, you say, you mentioned Luke there, and one of the things that comes through in the book is, is his personality, and there's yeah. a lovely letter that they've yeah. reproduced in the book, is him pleading with you to let him buy a bird, and yes. his commitment to the care of the bird. We, we do, through the book, and so I urge you to read it, you do get a little sense of yeah. who Luke was, yeah. and particularly at that stage in his life, because he was changing, wasn't he? He was, and... You know, the most gratifying thing for me is, you know, um, just weeks and a few months before he died, various friends of mine that um, within the community um, who hadn't seen Luke for some time but had bumped into him at an intersports school day or whatever, but I wasn't there. And he, you know, greeted them in a really well-mannered, engaging, respectful way. And they all said, you know, gosh, I bumped into Luke. You know, what a... He was such a lovely young man. And I thought... You know, your kids, obviously, when they're in, here in, at home with you, aren't always <laughs> perfect. So the very fact that he know, knew how to um, be social, be polite, well-mannered, engaging, and, um, and, and really, you know, I was really proud of him. Mm. Um, when you, actually, Helen Garner reminded me of something. She wrote a piece about you in The Monthly, and you talked oh, about yes. the response of people when you went out into yeah. the media, and she talked about the awe with which the rest of us looked at your, um, what you said that day. Um, but she also said a friend of yours rang up and said, get yourself together, you look like, excuse me, you look like shit. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you know why? He still rings me every day. It reminds me about how much weight I've put on. Um, and it reminds me, and he says, you know, like... People think you're special because you're Australian of the Year. Well, I know what you're really like. <laughs> now, so he keeps me grounded. And he's actually, you know, since Luke died, I have to say that the, some of the best support I've had have been from male friends and, you know, my father and my brothers, um, which is, you know, really not that it, that's remarkable, but I do feel that it's really important to note that, um, you know, some of my best male friends are, and the people who speak to me each day and who perhaps have been on the end of the phone or with me when I'm at my most vulnerable. Mm. Now, after that, that, first, um, that first speech that you gave, which I think will go down as a, a, as a speech in the, in the contemporary history of Australia, actually, I think it was, it was an extraordinary moment where a lot of things came together. Um, but 
was there a part of you that wanted to retreat after that and go into your grief and stay there? I don't think not, not one moment, not, not at one time. And I think, again, it's not right for everybody. Every, but what you do realise is... Um, it, you know, I'm a person that likes company, but I'm a person that likes privacy and time to myself as well. But I found it incredibly important, I think, that my house, house was open, that everybody who knew me and Luke could come. And in the first weeks, the house was full all of the time. And, you know, family travel from New Zealand and from Australia to be, um, England to be with us. And to have that display of support, that emotional support was incredibly important. Um, you know, I live alone, um, except I have dogs and cats and everything. Um, and my family are in the UK. So for me, I enjoy having the space and privacy in my own home, but it would make me really depressed if I was alone too much. And I think that's the balance for me, that, um, you know, some people, it wouldn't work for them, but for mm. me, it really has. And I think that by being able to push myself um, to do the things that seemed, ha seem intuitively right to do, have indeed been right to do. And so from that, I have gained so much more. And in fact, what really used to, dare I say, piss me off was, was when I um, would be, you know, at the beginning people would say to me, don't you need time to grieve? And I think, I'm grieving, for goodness sake. You know, you, grieving is, it comes in waves and it, it affects you at different times. Sometimes you're losing, you know, you're, you're screaming at something that is just nothing. And, you know, that's grief. And other times, you, you know, welling up with tears from a triggered memory, that's grief. Other times you, you know, there's different, it looks in different ways. And I think that, you know, by people saying, I just don't know what to say, well, I would much rather somebody come to me and say, I'm really sorry and I don't know what to say. And I go, you know what, thank you, because I don't know what to say either and that's okay. But other people you never see again, you know, because either that triggers sadness for them or they feel awkward, so they'd rather avoid you. And for me, that's been the hardest part of my journey is, is people not knowing how to speak to me. And you see the you know, that, that kind of fear in their mm. eyes because they kind of are frightened to meet you. And maybe they're frightened because of their own emotions and they don't want to upset you. But I think it's all very normal. And, and for me, it's normal to be... It's OK to well up with tears or, um, you know, to, to have... Uh, but now, I, I, people come to me and they go, hi, Rosie. Are you Rosie Batty? <laughs> and somebody said to me one day when I was walking the dogs, do you know, has anyone told you you just look like Rosie Batty? <laughs> and I said, yes, this is Rosie Batty without makeup on. <laughs> She's not as good looking. You said once that you, you wondered whether the, the activity that you became more and more involved in, I mean, it started and then it mm. just the momentum picked up and it hasn't mm. stopped since and we're, we're months yeah. and months later. But that, in the, that a part of that was a way of trying to reverse what had happened. Yeah. I think, you know, in my life, I've always been very driven and, very, and pushed myself, always. You know, I emigrated here and really I was a backpacker. I had no intentions of living here. Um, you know, when you first move from another country, you go through homeless, homesickness, you have to establish a new network of friends. Well, now I've lived here longer than I lived in the UK, even though the UK, in one way, when I'm here, that I refer to the UK as home, but when I'm in the UK, I refer to here as home. Um, but um, I can't remember the question. <laughs> Filling your days full of activity, you yes. know, is that is that a way of yeah? So I it think at bay? you know, so for me, I've I've gone through events in my life where I've had to work out how to push through mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. and it could be a broken relationship. It can be, you know, moving from Melbourne to Sydney and having no friends in Sydney, mm -hmm. and then moving back to Melbourne, and then you know, re-establishing yourself, having to push through 
you know, career ups and downs, whatever it is, you know, we all have tough times. Um, and sometimes it's not apparent why we're feeling depressed, but there's always kind of, um, you know, you, you go through different times in your life and need different things at different times. Why, yeah. why did you say yes to being the Australian of the Year? I don't think I was asked. <laughs> <laughs> You Actually, I don't it. think you were asked. I don't think you get nominated, it, and, and it's it happens. Just, yeah, I think it's. Um, and look, you know, when I, it's it's nearly a year since I was here, and remembering that um, for the first time, all of Australian of the Year finalists came together to have a look um, to talk about the um, to be interviewed, and for the first time, we heard each other's stories. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, these people are amazing. There is not a hope in hell that I'll win. And I thought, and I don't care because these are amazing people and this is an amazing experience. And even to be nominated and having the, you know, to come to, to um, Canberra, to be invited and have the opportunity to do so many things and meet so many different types of people and the whole ceremony in itself and the leading up to it, that's an enormously... Mm. A, a life-changing memory. Um, so, even if you didn't win, mm. you you would never you wouldn't begrudge it of anyone else, and you'd be really happy for them. Now, you'd, yeah. you'd already seized the moment in a sense that you'd been giving you'd been given giving lots of interviews, and you'd, mm. you were talking about domestic violence yes. and domestic and family violence. What is it that you thought you could do by taking that position? Well, I think one of the reasons I felt that you know it wouldn't be me that would win is because. It's, the people I, you know, was with on that um, as the finalists have done amazing work over decades. You know, whether it's child advocacy um, for abused children or, um, you know, whatever it may have been, they've been doing that this for decades. Um, so clearly, for me, I think it was what I was going to do with the award and the timing of this social issue. Um, and so for me, I think that was, you know, what was. It's not what, you know, obviously everybody's done something to get there, but what are you going to do? And um, so for me, I, I knew that I couldn't let down mm. anybody because f family violence has never been an issue that really have people have openly discussed. Mm. And, you know, for the victims of violence that are still unsafe or cannot speak, and, you know, you look at the funding for frontline services, and it is abysmal. You look at the response that we need to keep victims and children safe, and it is far from adequate. And you realise that this social issue that has always been there mm. needs to have a voice. And, you know, for all of those people working in the family violence sector who have worked in it for decades and felt that they would never, ever have government on their side. Does that mean that at the beginning that your ambition was in a way a simple one, that you were just going to talk about it and that's mm. how you were going to change things? I, really, I, I think that, um, you know, I was aware that I needed a strategy. Mm. I was an, aware that, um, and I, I guess my strategy was always going to be to continue to develop relations with the media because mm. recognising that with the media supporting this issue, but not just supporting it, actually becoming very informed about how they they report this issue, can either, you know, again, uh, sensationalise the story mm. and have the wrong connotations and cause harm, mm. or it can be reported um, in an educational way so that we, as a, as a society and as a community, start to recognise that we were experiencing two women a week being murdered. Mm. And that by somehow blaming victims, you know, continues that, um, I guess, the, the community um, awareness that we're really trying to shift. Now, at, at the same time, I, I find myself... I've asked this question myself in my ignorance many times. Yeah. Why doesn't she leave? We know it's a question that you're not supposed to ask, but I know a lot of people can't help yes. themselves from asking the question. Did you already understand? Now, you had a different relationship with Greg because he wasn't living with you for all mm. of that time, but did you already understand why that question is the wrong one? Yeah, and look, I think... Um, 
I can't quite remember how many years ago I qualified, I um, graduated, but I did a diploma in community welfare and I studied family violence as an elective. And so I actually had already been trained in, in it as a subject and also trauma and attachment theory, um, which I found, you know, all those subjects incredibly interesting. Ironically, I couldn't get a job in the welfare sector. And um, yes, <laughs> I couldn't. So I ended up um, not pursuing a career in the welfare, but doing something else. But without a doubt, my studies and my training, which I loved, have absolutely equipped me with the understanding I now have. It doesn't make me an expert, but I can tell you I'm a hell of a lot more of an expert than a lot of the people that deal with vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. And that really concerns me. So the, one, one of the big questions, and this, this emerges from many of the things that you've said, is the degree to which we are still putting the onus mm. on women to protect themselves. Mm. And indeed for you, that was the case, that on mm. various points in that, over that decade or more, you were put in the position where you were expected yeah. to manage Greg and you were expected to keep Luke and you safe? Still what we do, you know, and basically the question, you know, why doesn't she leave? Again, it comes from the position of, we assume that y you should do something. Yes. You know, the, now we've got some very knowledgeable women here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, because I'm hearing the very confirmation, makes me feel very good. So what we're doing, you know, what is it about women having to take more responsibility mm. for everything? So this is very entrenched in society. So what we've always expected is that women um, to do something. And you know, and that's what I experienced when I had Luke. People would be saying, well, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? It was never a question of, well, you know what, Greg, <laughs> would you stand up to him as a six foot man? Mm. Do you really understand what fear is mm. and to be unsafe? So. When we consider that at this point in time, and we've had some real tragedy here in Canberra, some significant tragedy this year, mm. when you choose to live in a relationship, that is at your most vulnerable point. So that is the time when the violence can very much escalate. Now, uh, now yeah. you, you, you knew that, and yet you were actually, you went to police, you went to the system to help you mm. put things in place to protect yourself. Now, it was a complex history. What, what did you take from that? When you, when you then went into your year and you were going to bring about mm. change, what is it that you wanted to change more than anything else? Well, I think that my real, my, I'm very concerned that people are not doing risk assessments with mm. victims of violence. Um, and sadly, if you come in from particular angles, you won't necessarily ever have a risk assessment. Or that the risk assessment that you're given it actually doesn't include you that other people are actually deciding without even speaking to you and understanding and taking time to talk to you about the history of, you know, of, of the abuse. And, you know, I very much agree with the strengths-based approach, which is that, you know, you need to... It's your decision what to do. But sometimes, if you've been in, in, a, in an ongoing violent dynamic, you, you may absolutely need some further expertise to understand and look at the violence is escalating or you know or there you know this has gone on for a long time and you need somebody to kind of really i think have an expertise here so for me the violence wasn't enough for me to qualify because i needed three incidences of violence in a year not just the two to go to a, the family violence specialized unit mm. in my area if that had happened, they would have advocated with me in court, they would have mm. helped me with intervention orders, they would have been more in, in, in involved with Greg. But at that point, child protection never did a risk assessment. Um, there's lots of, lots of things that could have been done differently and the coronial inquest, mm. the outcomes from that have now been announced. And universally it is, you know, you would really expect the training to be so much better for people who are involved in, in the dynamics of family violence. Now, when you look at, look at you now, it, it's, and you talked about the 
the position for women going through court is, is about as lonely as it's possible to be. But you look at you and you're, you're well educated, mm. Mm. you know how mm. to advocate for yourself, mm. and yet that system drove you to tears. It drove you to a point where mm. other people told you to calm down. Mm. How mm. do we change that? A, re a total revamp of our judicial system. <laughs> there is nothing call. less. Mm. It comes down to our magistrates and judges who are not God and actually need to really, like everybody in society, become aware of this issue and that it isn't your fault and you are not to blame. And when you consider, Sarah, what's really interesting is the law and the history of the law. And I haven't become an expert in this, but I've had some very interesting facts shared with me that I, at some point, would like to investigate further. And one of them is, um, you know, we commonly say the rule of thumb. Well, the rule of thumb comes from the law in England where you were able to beat your wife and mm. family um, as long as the welt wasn't wider than the thumb. So we come from a society that allowed you and gave you the privilege and entitlement to own your wife and children and do what you will with them. So that kind of attitude is still somewhat present in our society and that's what we really have to address and look at openly and honestly because I know from my grandmother's era, although she, she was the centre of our world and the centre of our family and never experienced violence in any description, you know, she was a housewife. Mm. She didn't drive. She had no financial independence. But, you know, she, that's what... And if you made your bed, you lie in it. You're married for life. Mm. So, you know, we've changed a lot. But there is, you know, what we... We are not experiencing equality. And I think it's... There's a, certainly what I'm being... You know, what is reaching me is there is a, a shifting awareness too. Because I don't think young women are taught the history of a woman's journey either. And I was lucky to see a preview screening of a new movie with Meryl Streep in it, although she's very in it very briefly, called Suffragette. Mm -hmm. mm. And it's a really great film and it's really worth going to see. But the lasting impression was, oh my gosh, how far have we really come from the fight that they had for the vote to true equality? So how did you, when you, when you look over this year that you've been living, going to events, sometimes, as you say, said before, three events in one day. Mm. You have this experience, you have this tragedy. How did you manage the year that's, that's just, that's not quite finished yet, but still going? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, people say, oh, how do you cope talking about it all the time? But actually, you know, one you've probably picked, I love talking. Um, I, I, and when I say I love talking, I, le I love deep conversations. Mm. I love conversations with meaning. I love to robust debate with intelligent people. So I, learn to, I love to feel like I can learn and keep learning. And I certainly, even though it's, it, what worries me sometimes is that people see me as a bit of an expert, and I'm thinking, God, um, what am I an expert in? Yes, I'm an expert in what it's the experience of being a victim. Um, but have I the expertise that people feel, and all the answers that sometimes people expect me to have, which feels, you know, puts pressure on me sometimes because I feel like I don't mm. know everything. But um, I feel that the conversations I have or the talks that I give, it's not dwelling on the misery and the demise of the journey of being the victim. It's, it's kind of allowing me to certainly continue to remind people of the prevalence of the issue. But by being able to, um, I feel... I feel like I'm making some difference. And I feel like I'm making some difference because of all the wonderful comments that people write to me or email me mm. or post on Facebook or greet me at the airport or wherever they may see me and, and say. And it's men and women, lovely old and young people, say to me, we think you're great. We admire what you do. Keep doing what you do. So for me, it gives me incredible reassurance that I'm on the right track, that I'm doing something that's appreciated, that gives me purpose and meaning, and I think that's what everybody needs in their life. Um, do you understand where that comes from? Because you, you meant, used the word victim there. I think we'd all agree there's one thing about Rosie that 
the, the, the word never mm. occurs to me to think of you as a victim. People don't look upon you as a victim. Yeah. Something happened that yeah. was terrible in your life, but you were not a victim, even though you are the person to whom it happened. Yeah. Is there something about your life that, that cr made you ready for that? Yeah. Look, I think that... And again, this is what I've learnt about my journey is because people ask me questions and I have to really think, which I, I've always really liked to do. So it makes you really appreciate events in your life or people in your life or books you've read or films you've watched or what is it that has given you the toolkit that you've, you're carrying with you that help you through adversity. And I, I, you know, I really think that probably the, you know, the first life-changing incident, and I think we all have them from childhood, that you can turn the clock back and say, when that happened to me, it defined me in a way and changed my life. And I lost my mum when I was six. You know, my brother Robert was four and my little brother was not even two. So to be my father, to all of a sudden have three children under the age of seven and a farmer, you know, was incredibly... It must have been an incredible thing for him. Mm. Um, back then, um, you know, my dad is one of the best men in the world, but not able to verbally or, you know, no way show his affection or, or feelings. And, you know, back then, we weren't told as children that she died. We didn't get to go to the funeral. We found out when he told us, and it seemed like everybody else had known before us. So that has been a bit of a pattern in our family, you know, and... Um, where we've, we've certainly got better at that. And I can honestly say, the first time I saw my dad, very emotional, was at Luke's, with mm. Luke's death. The second time was when he came over for Australian of the Year. And it was amazing, I think, for him to see, oh my gosh, you know, what's happened? You know, one minute I'm here for the funeral of my grandson, and the next minute I'm here because my daughter's being recognised as this. Mm. And, you know, in England, you don't have Engl English person of the year. <laughs> Pom of the year. Pom of the year. Yeah. <laughs> so they think, what's this Australian of the year thing? And so, you know, my friends were saying, Jeff, do you understand what this is? And he's going, well, what do you mean? And uh, they said, there's 23 million Australians. There's only one Australian of the year, and that's Rosie. And they're going, oh. <laughs> oh. You know, I think we're beginning to get it, that it's actually a really big thing. And... Um, Actually, my, my a friend of mine said to me while my parents were here, he said, your parents are the most underwhelmed people I've ever met. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder... In the most lovely of ways. Mm. I wonder if along with that, there is also a moral strength that comes yes. from yeah. them that you have inherited. It is, you know, when you look back, my grandmother lived till she was 100 mm. and actually she was an important part of the exhibit that was here. Mm. And what she modelled to me was no matter... You know, she lost her only daughter out of five children. She was the centre of her family. Everybody adored her. Everybody gained something when they visited. And her only complaint, really, was that she, had, she got too tired with all the visitors. Um, she was still fiercely independent. She still lived at home. She, you know, when she couldn't do something, then she became, became, did embroidery. When she couldn't do embroidery, she did tapestry. So she evolved and always kept up with what she could do. You never found her unable to cope with her life or mm. depressed um, or victimised. And, and she always had a chuckle and a, a, a good sense of humour, a very good sense of humour. So you do have within you the modelling of who has been there before you. And so from your grandparents, who were all hard workers, mm. you know, they're hard-working people. That's what they admire, you know, that physical hard work, um, and my dad the same, um, you know, and, you know, probably the, the difficulty we've had is the honesty in being able to express mm. emotions. So you, on the plus side, you have that English stoic, stoic mm. approach to life and pushing through adversity no matter what. On the other side of it, you've got the inability to speak openly, emotionally and, um, and honestly. So. And yet, you, it, it seemed that, I don't know whether this is you or whether it's coming here or a combination of, of those things, mm. but that with Luke, you had managed yeah. to bring both of those things yeah. together. Is that right? 
that's what I really strive to mm. do. And, you know, it was... It was really isolating for us to live over here and, you know, mm. there were times when I was disappointed not to see more of family or, you know, and things like that. But, you, you know, you tried your best to do the most you could and it was my choice to live in Australia. But then, of course, you know, when you have a child with somebody, it becomes not your choice, but, you, you know, you, you, you have a responsibility, which I think is fair and reasonable, to, to um, be able to support the relationship with both parents. You also had quite high expectations of Luke in a way, and I, I, mm. I, I'm, I'm very moved by that, that he, he had a difficult father, but you, you were training him to, to manage it, weren't you? Well, I felt that, you know, Greg adored him mm. and would go out of his way to travel for hours on public transport just to see him and give him a hug and then, you know, whatever strange dilemma or situation he was in. But he, he was always incredibly attentive and loving to Luke. Mm. Um, and so I would say, but Luke, you know, clearly his behaviour to me at times, not every time, but at times when he was threatened or challenged, mm were derogatory at best, <laughs> verbally abusive mm. most, and um, intimidating and, um, and physically um, challenging at, t at the worst. Mm. And I think that, you know, so clearly, you know, great Luke had memories, but a lot of it was kind of what he'd known. Mm. Um, but I was always open and honest with him, I think, and as you say, trying to perhaps work out an age-appropriate way mm that didn't shield him like maybe my family had done because kids were seen, not heard kind mm. of mentality. And, um, you know, I used to say to him, look, Luke, and I think, you know, people was... He, he, he didn't necessarily understand, but I felt at some point he would, would understand if he kept saying it. And I used to say, look, you will always love your dad and your dad will always love you, but you won't always like what your dad does. And I think that's it, isn't it? You know, you... you as a child, you're wired to love mm. your parents, mm. no matter what they do. You're wired to love them. And you can still love them, but not respect them or agree with what mm. they do. And, and then as you become an adult, you'll challenge that potentially. Um, but you'll always pretend, you know, you, I think it's very hard not to love mm. your family. In the course of this year, so you're giving speeches the book is being written. Mm. In the middle of all that, you also went through the inquest. Was that a good process in the end for you? Was it helpful? Yeah, I think that... I mean, the other irony of this is, too, that um, access to justice is becoming mm. more and more impossible, I think, for the average person. Those that get justice are the ones that can pay for it. Mm. Um, and I think that quite often, you know, with the other question, why doesn't she leave? Well, the financial financial problems are exactly one of the huge uh, hurdles, you know, whether it's, and very reasonable, fears of homelessness and poverty mm. um, are very realistic um, hurdles to leave. And that's across all socioeconomic, you know. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> The you know the the inquest. I mean, I look at yeah. you know again. It's the 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 great care and attention that went into the mm. inquest and the things that came out of it. Although yeah. no one thing is deemed to be responsible for Luke's death, apart yeah. from Greg's actions. Yeah. Um, what was the experience like of piecing all of that together? I think, and, and that's where I was really initially. I didn't really understand or know what the coronal inquest. Mm was likely to be and I thought oh look I don't need to know how he died I know how he died mm. I don't need to be part of this so I immediately kind of said no I don't want anything to do with it but then I was approached by a, um, a legal team who wanted to work pro bono with me because they felt that what had happened to Luke demonstrated systemic failings that were going to be high profile enough to, to be able to mm. really help with change. So I reviewed that decision and they helped me pro bono because with the coronial inquest, everyone else involved has state paid for legal, unlimited legal representation, except the victim. So, you know, you're, you're penalised along the way, mm. all along the way. And even though um, the coroner 
he's an incredibly fair and reasonable and really insightful man. Mm. He, he was brilliant. I would have most definitely been disadvantaged if I hadn't. I spent three days on that witness box. Talk mm. about victim blaming. Mm. And they don't even know they're doing it, but I spent three days on that witness box. I was the only one having to defend myself as the mother. And it was really intense. Mm. It was incredibly intense. And the good thing of that was, of course, it was intense for everybody in the room, including the media. And it was a really great example, I think, of saying, geez, you know, the mother got the, the hardest grilling mm. of them all. Mm. You know, when there were very questionable police responses, mm. very questionable child protection responses, very questionable systemic responses, but the one that got the most grilling was the victim. So for me, um, what I learned through that is the forensic detail that my, that my legal team went through and the piles, and I am talking of piles of folders of information from every angle. It was great for me because the night that Luke got murdered, um, a, a, a dear guy that um, worked with me from homicide, mm. had led the homicide in investigation, he said to me, Rosie, this was a premeditated act. You were not to blame. And that stayed with me all of the way through mm. this horrible journey. And all I could think of was, oh, my God, how would Lindy Ch Chamberlain have felt? You mm. know, when she was blamed right from the beginning by everybody and even served a prison term because we couldn't believe her and we made it fit that she was guilty because of the way she looked, because of the way she mm. acted, because we couldn't believe it was feasible. Mm. And, you know, years later, I realised it was a very bad investigation that was set up to really condemn her without, mm. you know... And um, she was suffering the grief of losing her baby. And yet, you know, and I kept thinking... So for me... I, through that forensic examination and all of the detail that came to me and looking at what everyone had said from every statement and from every angle really helped me fully understand the complete journey mm. and the parts, and, and I agreed with the coroner, it is futile to personally blame everybody, mm -hmm. but lack of training, lack of shared information, lack of collaborative mm. approaches failed Luke and I. So it's the system that needs to develop and change. And so that's given me, you know, it, and when the findings were announced mm. a few months ago, weeks mm. ago, people were, cons you know, like, how are you going to feel? How are you going to feel? I actually felt good because I felt that Judge Gray had really taken on board every angle that my legal team had presented to him. He missed nothing. Mm. And he, again, didn't blame anybody, but the findings he did give and the recommendations were completely on line with what we, we wanted to have. Does what that uh, detective said on the night, that it was a premeditated mm. attack, and I know that there were a series of, of thing, events leading up to it that make that very clear, does that mean that you were, to some extent, <coughs> relieved of the terrible what-ifs? Yeah, I think so. Look, and I think the journey of grief also, you go through different phases. Mm. The first stage is, you know, how much did Luke know? Did he feel pain? You know, what could I have done? But I think that, you you know, you are incredibly protected because you can only, your body can only absorb so mm. much information and it numbs you in, a, in quite a, a way for a period of time. And, you know, you're there, but you're not. And, and, and look, I don't even know whether what people would say about me in those early days or early mm. weeks and how I am different now or not. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't mm. really talked to them about it. Do you it. feel like you're different? Yeah, because, you, you know, you're, you're much sharper, more clarity. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I think back then I'd probably... Mind you, I can still do this. Um, you know, flip from one thing to the next thing mm. without following, you know, keeping that train of thought... Mm. Um, but certainly I think that it, it, it has helped me enormously and particularly all the way through the investigation. I, w I work very closely with a, ma a man called Char Sharon Def Singh who is a completely mm. unsung hero. Mm. He works 
on criminal inquests all of the time. And I looked in the paper earlier, it was yesterday I looked in the paper in Melbourne, and it had a coronial finding of a woman that was happening within weeks of Luke's, mm. and it was an Indian lady who had been, I hope, murdered before she was set on fire. But he tracked her down using mm. a private detective. And when he heard, and he got, he was, he killed himself too. Mm. But w the only person that Crowley inquiry was the private detective. Mm. And no one representing her. And it was a death, a tragic death. And she was a faceless victim. Mm. And so somebody like Sharon Dev Singh and people in the sector wanted it to b not just be another incidence of a tragic murder mm. that otherwise would have been another, just another one. Because without somebody representing them, you know, it doesn't have the same voice. And also, um, Darcy Freeman, the mm -hmm. little girl that got thrown mm. off the Westgate Bridge, it mm. seems her findings I read in the paper as well. And again, she had been to various agencies and people and said, this is what my husband's doing, da 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 So it's an unf unfortunately not joining dots together, not recognising mm. certain threats, minimising them, dismissing them, not breeding significant psychological... When, when you actually go back over that, that um, sequence of events yourself, and you, mm. as you said, you had some training in the area, so you knew what family violence was, unlike most people who don't think they're in it until something yeah. happens. Um, when you look back on it, does, does it look different to how it felt living through it? Yeah, look, I think, you know, one of the things I talk a lot about now is we really feel that the worst of family violence is the physical. Mm. That, you know, unless you... And, and certainly, you know, it's very hard for the police to prove psychological mm. violence. Um, and it's very much more so, you know, harder, very hard. You know, so the threat to kill me the year before and mm. various things he did even if they got to court, which they didn't get to court, um, it would be unlikely that he would have been penalised in any way, or mm. indeed, because it wasn't witnessed, that he would indeed have, they would have believed me. So, um, I think when I look back, what I did do, which is like a lot of other people, I felt my situation wasn't as bad as <laughs> other victims, mm because I hadn't been hospitalised or beaten and, think, and he'd re restrained his control at different times. What I'm completely convinced of now is that psychological violence is possibly more dangerous mm. than the typical, and not that I'm saying any is better than the other, but I would say the psychological violence is incredibly concerning and, sh and somehow we have to work out how we we take that into account very seriously. How, yeah. how do politicians respond to your forthright manner? Um, they don't like it when I talk about family terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> Other people do. <laughs> because I think that's one of the questions that comes up to mm. me quite a bit now mm. is the wording. Why do we say family violence? Why do we say domestic violence? Mm. Why don't we just say men's violence towards women and children? Mm. So I'm not really precious on language. It, to that point, I'm not sure what is right, but I do understand the importance of language. And I think we, you know, because violence is, is not tolerated on our streets, it, to, violence is not tolerated, mm. and yet put family in front of it, and all of a sudden it's reduced and not seen as quite as bad, which is completely ask about face really because what it should be is if you're experiencing violence in your own home mm. that should be even worse and you know I was talking at a community event a couple of days ago in um, at Swinburne University and I had a, a, an older lady she was 82 she came to me and said Rosie I've been really wanting to meet you and she passed me an envelope and said this is my story and I said Look, it may be a little while. I will get back to you, but it may be take me a little while. And she's experiencing elder abuse. Mm. Her son-in-law and her husband, and she's, she doesn't actually even know whether she's going to be murdered. Mm. And I'm thinking, 
you know, there are many forms of abuse. Mm. And we have a lot of older people who are incredibly vulnerable, who are dependent on their carers or dependent on their family and are intimidated and very, very frightened. Mm. And so we have a huge violence within our families. What you're seeking to do, and we've heard this from the language that you've used, this is, this is by way of wrap-up, is that in fact you're challenging all of us, aren't you, to mm. reconsider the way our society functions and the way we mm. relate to one another. You've had an extraordinary um, year as Australian of the Year. The book is extraordinary. It'll be two years in February since Luke died. Yeah. What's next? Um, well, I'm going on holiday <laughs> trekking in <laughs> India for two weeks. <laughs> Bon voyage from However, everybody. I will confide that I did go on a f fun... Well, it wasn't a fun run. Mm. It wasn't fun <laughs> for me. Um, some people had a lot of fun. Um, I did the walk, and it was supposed to be 10Ks, and I got... I had to get somebody to come and pick me up after 6Ks. <laughs> so I have a lot of training to do. I'm very unfit. So getting fit and healthy mm -hmm. is really important for me next year. It's been mm -hmm. incredibly difficult mm -hmm. to say no to dessert and good wine mm -hmm. and <laughs> great hospitality. Um, and in March, I'm going to New York to the women, uh, women's, you know, United Nations Women's Conference, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited about. And um, so next year is really growing my foundation um, We've ha we have a Never Alone campaign, and what I would suggest is if you... Do you not know how to Google? Do you like... <laughs> do you know... <laughs> um, if you go on to neveralone.com.au and join my campaign, and what it is is it's a campaign that I've set up to support victims of violence um, and say you'll never be alone. And I have currently over 40,000 members, and... That it was designed so that when I'm no longer Australian of the Year, that the momentum will keep going and continue to really keep this as an issue that governments can't avoid. So that is what I'll be doing next year. I have had some interesting um, conversations about roles mm. and um, the main thing that's important to me is that we cannot let this topic go back behind closed doors. I do understand that because it's never been a topic we've really discussed, unless you're involved or mm. have been personally experiencing it, and let's face it, one in three women have, mm. there are a lot of myths. There are a lot of misunderstandings. So let's talk about them. Let's understand them. But what we really need to say is it is not your fault if you're a victim of violence. We need to introduce people who are affected in violent relationships into support services. And the best way to do that is ring 1-800-RESPECT and to talk about your situation and then be connected to the correct specialised service who can support your decisions. And if that means crisis response and, 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 and um, an involvement, what's most important is finding safety. But what we really need to do is and this is where we haven't even really begun, mm. but we will see a lot of change in this space, is when we start talking about victims and why doesn't she leave, let's switch the conversation and say, why has that man chosen to be violent? Because it's not, it is a choice. It's not alcohol, it's not drugs, it's not mental illness. It is a choice. And one of the things that the, our new Prime Minister said recently, which... Mm. I've rehearsed many times now, and I think I'll get it right. He said, not all disrespect of women ends up in violence, mm. but all violence begins with disrespect. So I think if we, you know, if we understand that a victim of violence is not to blame, and we should not be discussing what they do and what they don't do with criticism and judgment, what we should be doing is placing the blame on the perpetrator of violence, placing the blame there and saying, what can we do? What do we have to do as a society to own this problem and stop this from happening? And, you know, it seems to be such an insurmountable problem. However, when, you know, I hear our previous police commissioner from Victoria, Ken Lay speak, 
he com compares it to the anti-smoking campaign. Mm. And so when I came to Australia 28 years ago, you could smoke in the workplace. If you were here now, you'd be fagging away. <laughs> We'd be smoking our heads <laughs> off. And we all know now, you can't smoke in public places, you can't smoke on t um, flights, you can't smoke in cinemas, you can't smoke in workplaces. And if you do want to smoke, you'll have to go right out the building, right down there, and, s you know, and we know that smoking is not the right thing to do. We know that it's not cool and we know that the health risks are huge. And our younger generations are actually growing up thinking, that's dirty, that's smelly, why are you doing it? Mm. And Luke certainly was, you know, really one of those kids that thought, you're crazy, mm. I don't understand why people would smoke. Mm. So that is, you know, that has taken two decades, maybe longer, I'm not sure. But certainly, the turning point, I believe, was when we realised passive smoking was killing us. And the very fact that you might not be a smoker, but someone was killing you because they were smoking beside you. So I guess that's where I can see great hope, is that when we as a society, with government leadership and investment, but all of us taking responsibility, we can see that violence in the home, violence isn't something we have to put up with and live with, that in fact, we, we will see long-term change. I think when we look back on this period and we look for the turning point, I think Rosie Batty will have been that turning point. The challenge is to all of us to create the society that she's talking about. You are a conscience for all of us. Thank you for speaking with us today and thank you for listening to Rosie.